Titus, Titus chapter 1, and uh, Titus chapter 1. What I want to do, I want to look at some things uh, that's on my mind, and I don't know what, sometimes I, I, I speak about things, and I have, then Robbie will call me, and he'll say, uh, what, what's the title of your message? And uh, a lot of times I don't have a title. We just have to put down something, you know. And, uh, I, and so this is one of those. So he's here. He won't have to. He'll figure it out. He'll figure out his own title for it. But this is one of those. It's not something. It has to do with unbelief. It has to do with uh, what's in this world today. And so I want you to see in Titus chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, and hope of eternal life. Uh, now that hope of eternal life is not a hope, it's not, it's not like, oh, I hope this happens, it's not an element of doubt in there. But hope in the Bible, biblical hope, has to do with anticipation, expectation of something that you have the assurance is going to happen. And so that's the hope of eternal life. Uh, I'm hoping for that eternal life. I'm expecting it. I, I have it, and I'm anticipating of it being a reality in my life. Uh, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. And the promise was of eternal life, and it was promised before the world began. And that promise was to the Lord Jesus Christ, no doubt. Uh, because uh, Paul said in verse 3, But hath in due time, times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me uh, according to the commandment of God our Savior. Now, it's just not preaching that was committed to Paul. It's not, he's not manifesting his word just through preaching, but he's manifesting his word through preaching, which was committed to the Apostle Paul. He said, which is committed unto me but it's preaching committed to Paul that is being manifested that God wants to make manifest today. Well, where do you find Paul's preaching? You don't find it in the book of Acts. You find it in Romans through Philemon. You find what Paul believed and what he preached through the writings of Paul. And that's the word that God is manifesting today. And it has to do with eternal life. Everybody in the world is looking for that fountain of youth. Everybody in the world would love to have eternal life and live forever. They do. They want to live as long as they can live. They want to look young, as long as they can look young. That's plastic surgeons have made millions, billions off of trying to make people look younger. Cosmetics, all this, trying to make people look younger and to stop the aging process and to stop death, all of these things. Man is seeking for it. And yet God has promised eternal life. Now look back, hang on to Titus, turn back to 2 Timothy, and look in 2 Timothy, and notice in chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Verse 10. but is now made manifest. What is? Well, his purpose, uh, you'll find it in verse 9, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, 
but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Well, there's, he had a purpose and he had a plan before the world began, and that promise of eternal life before the world began is a part of that purpose that he had for you. You are a part of the big picture that God saw before the foundation of the world. Isn't that a blessing for you and me, a nobody? Uh, I mean, don't even deserve to be here. Deserves to be in hell. Deserves the, the wrath of God. But yet God had a purpose, and I'm a part of that purpose. Brother, that's something to me. But look on. He said there, a grace which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished what? Death. And hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. That's the word. That's what's being manifest. Now, it's the gospel of Christ. It's that Jesus Christ he died your death so you could have his life. He became poor so that you might be rich. And God is offering the world today eternal life and immortality. And it's by the gospel. And what about the gospel? It's believing it and receiving the gospel of Christ. That's how simple it is. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believe it. And that is the kicker. People don't want to believe it. And when I say believe it, I'm talking about resting in it. I'm talking about trusting it, that Jesus Christ, the Savior, the one that was born, the one that people today are going to be talking about in a few weeks, that one that came into this world, born of a virgin, never committed a sin, never had a bad thought, and he went and lived a perfect life and was nailed to a cross and died and paid the wages of sin which is death he died for you he died for all of your sins every sin you'll ever commit every sin you'll ever think about he paid the price for you so you could have eternal life that's how God is manifesting it today and you can receive it or you can reject it and people want to reject it and add to it, and add on to it, and talk about, well, that's good, but there's got to be more to it than that. I think you have to turn from your sins and, and give up your sins and do all of these things. And if you do that, God will receive you. No, no, no. It ain't a fact of me receiving Him or Him receiving me. It's a fact of me receiving what He did for me. And I have eternal life. Thank God for the gospel. I, it's like Robbie said, man, there's something wrong with people get tired of hearing what he did for me. I'm glad he went to that cross. I glory in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm so glad that he went there. And I look at the cross and the suffering, and I look at what he went through, and I say, thank you, Lord. I could never go through that, but you went through it for me. And the wrath that he bore, was my wrath and God will never ever judge me again. Never ever say a disheartening word to me. He'll speak well of me. Why? I'm in Christ. Thank God for it. People don't want to believe that. That word was manifest in hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie 
promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifest His Word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of our uh, God, our Savior. And I want to talk to you. Notice Paul uses two words a lot in his epistles. The first word is acknowledge. I looked it up in the old Webster's Dictionary, and I want to give you the definition of it. Acknowledge. He said there, it's a faith of God's elect. By the way, verse 1, he said, Paul, servant of God and apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, God's elect, there's Jesus Christ. He's the one that was elected to go. And it's as though they had a council back there in eternity past. And it's as though God said, there's some people out there that I want for my purpose. I want for myself. I'm going to fill the heavens and I'm going to show my glory by saving people and giving some people that didn't, do not deserve my eternal life. And I'm going to give it to them, but I got a problem. That problem is their sins have to be paid for. And I can see it in my mind's eyes. Jesus Christ said, of the word, and, and, and he said, I'll go. I'll go and I'll become one of them. And I'll die for their sins. I'll live a perfect sacrifice. I'll be the sacrifice for them. And the God the Father said, you do that. I'll give you eternal life again. And I'll give them eternal life. And he promised it to the world. Now, through Jesus Christ, where is that immortality? Where is eternal life? It's in Christ. It's simply just receiving it. Thank God for it. But acknowledge that. People don't want to acknowledge it. What is acknowledging? It's admit to be true. That's the number one definition in 1828 Old Webster's Dictionary. You admit to be true. By a declaration of assent. In other words, be in agreement to confess, receive it. When you acknowledge it, you receive it. You admit, hey, that's true for me. It's true that Jesus Christ went to that cross and died for my sins. I received that. Where is my salvation? It's in the cross of Christ. How can I be saved? I'll be saved by believing that He died for me and God buried Him and out of His sight and God raised Him the third day. A new creature. Thank God He come up as a quickening spirit and bless your soul, we came up with Him. We acknowledge the truth and admit that to be true. And then Paul uses the word ignorant over and over. Ignorant is not being stupid. Ignorant is not being unteachable. What is ignorant? An ignorant person is a person that is untaught or uninformed, uninstructed, unenlightened. Now, I've, I've heard, and I did some reading, and one of the, uh, I looked up, there are some medical procedures that are simple. They told them, I was reading it, and I was reading this article, how that, one of the simplest is appendicitis. Take out that appendix. Simple procedure now. Compared to brain surgery. Simple. Anybody in here knows how to take out somebody else's appendix? I wouldn't want you taking out mine. Why? 
You're ignorant. You hadn't been taught. You hadn't been enlightened about it. You hadn't been instructed about it. It's not that you couldn't learn. It's not that you can't do it. It's that you're on, you hadn't been taught. You're not trained. When Paul talks about ignorance, he's talking about people that's not taught in the Word. He's not, he, they hadn't been trained, they hadn't been taught. So that brings me to my point. There are three unbeliefs in the world. Number one is an infidel. An infidel is someone who doesn't believe the Bible at all. All infidels are lost. Some months back I asked a guy, I went through the gospel. I went through just the simplicity of the gospel of Christ. And I asked him, I said, do you believe that? He said, no. I said, do you not believe that Jesus Christ went to the cross? No. Do you not believe that he died? Do you not even believe that there was Jesus Christ? I said, can't prove it. I don't believe it. And he looked at me and he said, where do you get all your information about all that? And I said, out of the Bible. He said, see, I don't believe the Bible. I don't believe God has anything. I, don't, I believe that's just the writings of men that wanted attention. That's an infidel. There are no saved infidels. Number one, if you're an infidel, you would be saved because somewhere you'd have to believe the gospel of Christ. Number two is a heretic. Someone who misuses the Scripture to teach something that isn't so for personal gain. That's a heretic. Look with me in Titus. You're there in Titus. Look in chapter 3. Notice in verse 10. A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition rejects knowing that he that is such a heretic, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. That word subverted is turned upside down. It has to do with destroying, ruining. They're ruined. Like Robbie said, they're, they're junk. A heretic he could be saved, but he's been, his faith has been overthrown. And he's got into false doctrine, and he's doing things that he shouldn't be doing with the Scripture. These people teach things. Look in chapter 1. In chapter 1, verse 9. Titus chapter 1, verse 9, holding fast the faithful word as he's been taught, that he may with what? Able by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Now here they are. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert, there's that word subvert, they turn it upside, they ruin it, they destroy it. Subvert whole houses, why? Teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. There are people today that are out there ruining people and they're teaching things to get people's money and that's all they care about. And they, I don't care, name them off, the Benny Hens, the Joyce Myers, all of these people are subverting other people and ruining other people and they're teaching things. They are heretics. Look with me and turn to uh, Romans. 
I tell you what, stop at Philippians. Look in Philippians chapter uh, 3. Philippians chapter 3. A heretic is someone that takes the Scripture, uses the Scripture, and twists it to fit their needs for their own personal gain. There are pastors today that would not dare preach the truth if they saw it because it would disrupt their gain. Look in Philippians chapter 3. He said in verse 17, Brethren, be ye followers together of me, and mark them which also as ye have us for an example. For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, their flesh, and their glory, whose glory is in their shame, and who mind earthly things. That's all they talk about. It's fleshly things. That's all they promise people. It's fleshly things. I heard a guy the other day talking about how that God did not want any of his children to be in debt. And if you do this and send in your seed, God will get you out of debt. You'll reap if you'll sow to this ministry. Give me a hundred dollars and God will pay your debt. That's a heretic. Paul said, mark them and avoid them. He said a heretic after the first, second admonition, what? Reject. Look with me in Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16. And I don't care who they are. It don't matter. I, hope, I mean, you listen to this crowd. Anybody twist the thing around. But look in Romans chapter 16, verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, there's that belly again, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. That simple is just common people like I am, like you are, just common, ordinary people want to get along in life, live a life of peace and happiness, raise our family and everything. Then along comes a preacher or a teacher and he wants to, and you're going through rough times, promises you, and people look to them and they got confidence in them and all the while they're picking their pockets promising them things that God never promised them. And I know people that have sent their life savings to people. And now they don't have anything. I'm telling you they're out there. That's a heretic. The third type of belief in the world is the most dangerous of them all. And that's apostate. Someone who professes to believe the Bible. Did you catch that? They stand up and they say, I believe the King James Bible is the Word of God. And all the while you know they don't. Because when you present it to them, oh, it don't mean that. Oh, uh, it means something else. The apostate is someone who professes to believe the Bible, but does not. He, most, a lot of them are saved. 
Look what they do. Turn to Second Peter. Second Peter. And notice in chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3. The heretic, the apostate, is religious people. That old infidel out there, he don't believe the Bible. Now that don't mean a heretic, uh, infidel can't be saved because he might hear the gospel and then all oh, and the Spirit of God and he opens his eyes and can be saved. But this person here that's apostate, many of them are saved. Look in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. And count that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, Speaking in them of things, of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned, they're ignorant, unstable, what do they do? They rest, as they do also the other scriptures under their own destruction. They rest. It's like they wrestle it. They tug at it. They twist it. They turn it around. As they do other scriptures. They take Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And they are twisted and say, because you're saved, you ought to be baptized. Because of your remission of sins, be baptized. And they twist it and they tug at it and they make people believe something that's not true. Apostate is someone who professes to believe the Bible but does not can uh, be saved. They're the most dangerous. They twist the Scriptures and... They are unstable. They wrestle and twist it to make it fit their doctrine. Now, I want to tell you something. If my doctrine don't fit Paul's doctrine in Romans through Philemon, I'm changing my doctrine. Amen? I'm not changing the Word of God to fit my doctrine. Now, what are we to do quickly? Number one... Look in First Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy chapter 4. And I'm going to give you three quick things. They're going to be real quick too. About 10 minutes piece. Quick. First Timothy, I'm just kidding you. First Timothy chapter 4. Notice what he says in verse 16. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Well, save if Timothy was a saved man. So what's he going to be saved from? Verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. You can't depart from something if you ain't been in it. And folks, here's the thing about it. They listen to the doctrines of devils through people. Those spirits are in men and women. And they're teaching doctrines. And they're leading people astray. And many of them have been in the faith. They lead the faith. They're giving heed unto those things. And Paul said, there's something you need to do. Number one, he said in verse 16, he said, take heed to thyself. And he said, you ought to consider yourself. Well, what is he talk? Look in Acts chapter 17, quickly. Acts 17. And notice what these people did. So what am I to do? Consider myself. I'm to be a Berean. In Acts 17, notice what he says there in verse uh, 
Uh, let's see, verse 10. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night to Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These, the Bereans, were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind. They were eager, eager to hear it and search the Scriptures daily whether those things were so. Do you know what I'm to do? I'm to consider myself. I sit and I listen to a preacher. I'm not just to take it at face value what that preacher says. I'm to uh, compare it with what Paul, my apostle, said. I'm to consider it. I'm to search the Scripture to see whether those things are so or not. Don't you ever take my word for anything. If I tell you it's my opinion, that's what it is. Just my opinion. I, but when I quote the Bible and I preach doctrine, you not just to take my word for it. Get in the Bible. Search the Scripture to see whether I'm telling you the truth or not. Consider thyself. You're to consider it. You're to be a Berean. Then he uh, notice in chapter uh, Second Timothy, chapter two. No, let me get there. Maybe chapter three. Notice the doctrine. Notice here in chapter three. Notice what he says in verse thirteen. But evil men, seducers. That's the man that is up here in verse, notice what he said in verse 5, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away, for of this sort of they which creep into houses, lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts. The silly there is the untaught. It's the same as ignorant. It's not that they're just sick. They have never, they not doctrinally established in the truth. And they go in here and they teach these doctrines to these people and they lead them away captive. And they're ever learning and never able to come unto the knowledge of the truth. And he gives Janus and Jambres as a type of what they do and those are the magicians that was in Egypt when Moses threw the uh, rod down they threw their rod down they're counterfeit they're out there deceiving and he said evil men and seducers had wax worse and worse deceiving and being deceived those are religious people they're apostates and they're out there to do so what does he say? Verse 14. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and has been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And he's talking about the scriptures. Then I want you to see, notice what he says there. We're to con continue. And he also says it in chapter 4, verse 16, where we was at. He said, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. Continue with Paul. Continue in them. The one faith. One other passage in Philippians chapter 4. Notice what he said. You're to continue in them with Paul. He said over and over, be ye followers of me. Follow me and the doctrine you received of me. You know what to save you from being apostate. You know what to save you from the mystery of iniquity. It's following Paul. It's realizing, acknowledging that Romans through Philemon is the truth of God to you. Not just for you, it is to you. Philippians, he says there, notice in verse uh, let's see, verse 9. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard. The receiving there is the acknowledging. You could but learn and acknowledge you agreement with them. Received and heard and seen in me. Forget. Is that what he said? 
Oh, that must be a new translation. Seen in me, do. And the God of peace shall be with you. You want to save yourself from apostate? Save yourself and from being caught up by a heretic? Save yourself? You stay with Paul. Rightly divide the word of truth. Follow Paul. Don't take my word for anything. Kevin's word, Robbie's word. Get in the book. Search the scriptures daily. What are those things that we teach and preach or so? And God of peace will be with you. Folks, they're out there. They're out there to get you. They're out there to hurt you. And this book is the only thing that will save you. Let's stand.